All right, uh, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We're delighted as usual to have Chase and Alex do the switch. And today we have Ray Batra. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. Take it away, Chase. Excellent. All right, so those of you who have uh, been around with us for a little while know that I like to start things off with a quote. I'll start with the quote, introduce you, Ray, and then we'll jump into some questions. So this quote is from John F. Kennedy. Not everyone has equal abilities, but everyone should have equal opportunity for education. And with that, I would like to welcome to this episode of The Switch, our guest, Ray Batra. Ray, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Do appreciate it. So before we jump into uh, a lot of the stuff that I want to talk about with Shift Up, uh, can we just get a little bit of your story? So the way that I like to ask this is if you could, you know, tell us a little bit about where you come from, things like that. But if you could divide your life into epochs, where I was before, where I am now, what are those, those points and how did you make that journey? Uh, sure. So the, um, <clears throat> if I were to break it into sort of three parts. So I think uh, first part, just as a little bit of background for everybody. I grew up in the U.S. Uh, in Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor specifically, so university university town. My um, my parents, um, you know, my dad was actually a professor at the university. Um, my mom also did, you know, a number of work. She actually spent a lot of time previously um, earning her uh, PhD in in adult distance learning. Actually, um, back in I want to say the '80s, I think, in uh, Columbia, and um, so I, you know, my my upbringing, right, was um, in many ways very blessed, right, very privileged in, in some capacity. I think um, I did go to public schools in Ann Arbor, um, which were a, a pretty awesome mix of, of folks. I mean, we had um, a huge range of diversity on many levels, which was a great environment to grow up in. I also religiously uh, grew up Unitarian Universalist. Um, so this was my dad was uh, is from India. Uh, he was raised um, Hindu, and my mom uh, grew up in the Detroit area, uh, Catholic. And so they sort of, when they when they met, they wanted to raise us in a, a different environment to explore various religious opportunities and, and paths ourselves. Um, so both from a racial perspective, from um, uh, and, and a number of other perspectives, got a lot of um, opportunity to to really diversity in many different, in different, many different categories when I was growing up. Um, I, until I was about 14 or so, was mostly, you know, I was a curious kid. Uh, I, I was compassionate, I am. And, um, but politically and sort of philosophically followed in many ways uh, my family. Uh, so started more liberal, started, um, didn't really think a whole lot, I think for myself. Um, but, but that changed, right? I think that changed when I was, um, I think it was 14, yeah, sophomore year of high school. And really around that time, I um, had a first existential crisis from a conversation with a mentor that lasted about four hours and uh, nearly drove me bananas. And um, I remember waking up from that conversation after the next day and, and thinking like, what the hell was true, right? Like what, what is going on in the world? Uh, I don't know what to believe. And so everything was shattered at that point. And I essentially spent, um, I want to say almost, I guess, seven-ish years, right, on a path uh, going into college, really um, uh, compelled to, to figure things out for myself. Um, and so that, that pushed me to a point of, um, at one point, I was certainly philosophically depressed, suicidal in different capacities um, when I was about a freshman in college. And um, really thinking about questions of um, morality and truth really around those, those two concepts. And um, I guess, you know, in my mind, I had come to a conclusion uh, at that time that, um, <clears throat> that, that purpose, I said truth, mora uh, truth um, morality, and purpose, that purpose was something that, um, you know, could never be achieved, that there was always more to, uh, to do and to accomplish. And for me, it was an external concept. It was something that um, 
revolved around the idea of maximizing social impact. And that, um, so, so I'd say this the second point in time, which was sort of after, uh, let's say after I sort of made that conclusion around 18, 19, I sort of turned my jet engines on, like as a person, as, an, as a, somebody who executes and get things done. And I pushed all the philosophical questions to the side. I didn't want to deal with them. I was like, okay, I uh, came, out, came out of this really, really deep, dark hole. And I was saying, okay, I, I don't actually know the answer to this. Um, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know what is at, what's at the very bottom of morality and, and what's truth. But someone had told me, um, you may figure it out later. And something in that phrase sort of shook me a little bit. And I said, okay, that's true. I have a long life to live. I can probably figure this out later. And so anyway, that's when I turned on, again, these jet engines. And I start, when I say jet engines, I mean, I was from the moment of waking up to the moment of sleeping, you know, 11 uh, at night, 12 at night, one in the morning, um, working on social impact projects. So I was in college, I was leading organizations, I was doing all these crazy things. And um, to an insane amount, to, to a point where the, the relationships that I had with other people, um, with um, romantic partners, with uh, friends, became really fucked up, to, you know, to be honest. Um, where I felt like when I was spending time, when I was spending time with them, and um, I felt like I, I didn't have the, um, uh, what's the word, the, um, I wasn't allowed to spend time with them just to spend time with them, right? Just to be sort of that in a human relationship. And so anyway, um, that became a problem. I ended up burning out. I you know, destroyed some relationships. It was not good. Uh, until my junior year of college, I went to, um, I, you know, I hit this burnout point. I hit, I hit a point, um, not good at all. And it, it shook me and I came out of that. And, and some of my best friends pushed me and said, Hey, now is your time to take all that energy that you're using to create things, right? To, to put in your professional life and literally turn that inward because you got some work to do, <laughs> right? And so I, I took a step out of that completely. And I, I spent, I, in my mind mentally was saying, okay, six months, a year, whatever it needs to take, I need to figure this out because something's wrong. And I spent, um, you know, I, I signed up for more humanities classes. I saw you all had, had interviewed Anne Curzan. I didn't have her as a professor, but I knew of her. I, I respect her. I've seen her TED talk. I think I've seen her in the hallway. But I did sign up for a uh, class at U of M taught by another JR. I saw that you also, you also interviewed somebody named JR, uh, John Rubidow. For those of you who maybe know him at Michigan, I don't know. But he taught a, an Art of the Essay course. And so I took, went back into some English classes. I went back into the humanities. I went back into, um, uh, most importantly, I... I enrolled in a, in a program called the New England Literature Program, the NELP program at Michigan, which is literally a semester, this, in this case, the summer semester, where 40 undergraduates go into the woods in New Hampshire without any technology. You're not allowed any, any technology except for a pencil and, um, and a dictionary and uh, take English classes and, um, and cook together. And um, you know, that, was, so that was six weeks. And as you can imagine, that's an, uh, an incredible opportunity to reflect, right? To think deeply, to have conversations, to dig in. And um, it, it, it was absolutely that, right? For me, it, it absolutely transformed my, my mind, right? So that was a switch for me. Um, I came out of that, the switch specifically, in my mind was, <clears throat> and it's been honestly years since I've dug into this really deeply. So some of this is not coming as fluently as it would back then. But I think for me, prior to that point, I had, I had prioritized rationality above all else, right? I had, I had sort of told myself that emotions ought to not play a role uh, or, or that they're somehow sub, you know, uh, subservient, I don't know what the right word is, to, to, uh, to logic and rationality. And because I felt we could be tricked by our emotions, which certainly is true, but we can also be tricked in other ways. And I realized how false that was for me in terms of um, when I think about first principles, I think about, you know, what is it that, um, that I want to build, you know, our life around. And, and, I, and I, to me, part of this was 
realizing that that starting with the idea that 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 rationality is somehow where we need to begin, um, or, or and maybe I'm using these words slightly incorrectly here, logic rationality, but it's almost a it's like circular logic because in order to get to that point, right, you have to use it itself, and there is 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 quite literally no actual inherent reason why emotion cannot um, uh, that experience, the human experience, is, is not just your head, but also your heart, right, in many ways. So really, I came out of that, of that experience of NELP with like another half to my entire experience that I had never previously valued, um, which was a tremendous shakeup for me. And um, there are other, there's a much larger, longer part to this too, right? That's just sort of one angle to the whole thing. But when I came out of that, I think that was the beginning, actually, of what I'm doing now. And, and, and for, uh, I'm going to quickly give an overview of what I'm doing right now, because I think that'll give some context. So right now, I am the founder of a company called ShiftUp. And ShiftUp is, um, ha has created a new category that we call learning gyms. And a learning gym is a physical space and community designed for online students. The reason for this is that online learning is lonely, right? It's, 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 as, it's as simple as that in many cases. Learning online is lonely. And that's not the case literally for every single person, but for the vast majority of people, I believe it is. We'll talk more about that. But, but as you can tell, right, for, for me, after college, so I, so, so I came back from NELP, I had one more year of school, and then I um, left college. And I went from there to Silicon Valley. And I, um, I felt free in many ways. Um, because before that, I, I felt in my mind that I was almost trapped. Like I, I felt like I had to maximize my social impact. And so I actually believed I needed to stay in Detroit. I believed I needed to work for the government and basically be a public servant in, in, a, in, in a particularly non without real freedom to, to choose otherwise. And um, so I chose to go Silicon Valley. I had, some, I had some friends there. I had an amazing opportunity. I worked for um, an education technology company. Um, and, and then after that company, about a year, I left and I came back to Detroit. I then, you know, what I had seen was the, the, the failures decade after decade of entrepreneurs and investors and many of them who are in many ways highly rational people, right? Look at technology and the potential for technology and education and say, oh, you know, we now, like if you think about education technology, it started out with correspondence courses, right? By mail, people would literally mail these courses to, to adults because they couldn't come to a college. And then, you know, from there you'd have, um, you know, television courses after television, you know, you'd have each new technology that came along, right? The internet and then, you know, 2.0, et cetera. And all these different times, people believed that traditional schooling would be disrupted. It would be quote unquote disrupted because of this technology. And the reality again is that school as a, um, as a product or service, right, that people use is not about the content, usually, right? Content is only a small, small slice of it. And so no matter how efficient and technologically advanced you can make the content delivery, the reality is for most people, it's a very emotional experience because the social aspects, but more deeply, more beyond just the social aspect, right? It's about the relationships, the relationships with uh, your instructor, the relationships with your peers. And relationships are, I'm not gonna say impossible to, to do virtually, but it's much, much more difficult. And, um, and also education, I think, when done properly, and when you really think about the bigger term education, is a lot about transformation. It's a lot about human identity. And um, in and, and many ways, that's a human process that, that benefits deeply from, from human relationships. So um, that's all fairly abstract. I mean, I think, so if I kind of, you know, there's like the part one, which is like me through 14, 
sort of part two is like 14 through 18 ish during that like really intense philosophical type phase where I was, you know, was almost suicidal. I was suicidal. And then, um, I'd say 18 through, um, you know, whatever it was, 2021 20, when I went to NELP and then post NELP. So really just sort of like those four stages if I were to break it up in that capacity. Um, and then I, I pro professional context for those who don't know, I mean, I've been very deeply interested in education since I was 16. So I was also blessed. I was a part of a scout troop, a Boy Scout troop that in Ann Arbor, we have sometimes incredible mentors. I had an incredible mentor who was happened to be, you know, a, a leadership and science education PhD, right? Taught graduate students. He was one of our, our scout instructors. And so we had an incredible leadership development training as high schoolers. And anyway, he got me into these conversations about education since I was 16 and I got into activism and reform. And then in, in college, you know, I started creating, advocating for, I actually created a couple of mini courses at the University of Michigan and then advocated for the university to create a new college campus in Detroit, which did a whole proposal on this, uh, like a future kind of campus of the future type of thing. Like a, uh, They didn't do it then, but actually fast forward just last fall, the university announced they are in fact launching a mini campus in Detroit um, that's meant to be of the future. So hopefully there was a seed planted in there with some of the executives I pitched. And um, and then I had, I actually did a little bit of substitute teaching in Detroit and San Francisco. I did some um, uh, online learning work as an intern for the University of Michigan. I did some policy work as an intern with the U.S. Secretary of Education. Um, so it's definitely a thread. I definitely care a lot about, a lot about um, I'd say what I care about most, and this comes directly from Nell, is, is what I believe life is about, for at least for me, which is helping people figure out who it is they want to be as people, as human beings, and helping them experience the freedom to realize it, right? To become it. And I try to do that with myself, and I try to do that with everybody at Shift Up, and that's what it's about. Awesome. That That's a, a great way to bring us in through your whole story and to Shift Up, and I want to get into a lot of the education stuff, but I think it's really important to talk about the philosophical principles. Um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, sort of the beginning stages of you as a, a political and philosophical being, just following in sort of your parents' footsteps. And, you know, I'm also from Ann Arbor. I understand that for most people in Ann Arbor, that means, you know, politically liberal, philosophically, you know, uh, uh, sort of, yeah, politically left. And then you mentioned a departure from that. Did you find in the departure from that that your inclination was to um, sort of pendulum swing to the extreme the other way? I mean, that, that's, that's something that happened in my experience because I, 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 I don't mirror that exactly, um, yeah. but that was something that I experienced in departing from the, the structures philosophically that were given to me. Like I fully experienced that inclination to go to the other side. And I think it was only, uh, you know, solid foundations in rational thinking that I feel have pulled me to a more balanced approach. Does, it, does any of that resonate you? And, and is that what your experience yeah. was? Or I mean, it, it does, certainly. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I've pendulumed around several times, right? I, I mm -hmm. think it's kind of my experience and most people's experiences are sort of like an onion, right? You got to peel back different layers. They're sort of, or trees, maybe the tree rings <laughs> sure. at different yeah. times. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think I've, I believe for myself that I've pretty consistently been, I think fairly independent uh, in terms of the sense that any singular political philosophy or, or party has not quite dictated my own personal opinions. Many of them, which I keep silent. I mean, I think, or I keep to myself, um, I mean, I do think that in my head, I have sort of a, a, a more consistent stream, but, but yeah, I, um, I certainly swung hard in the other direction in some cases and sort of ended up with a mix of opinions. Some that fell more, more right, some that fell more left on specific issues. So the other thing that stood out to me was you mentioned that, uh, you know, you felt almost in crisis existentially when you realized that you didn't have the answers to a lot of ground level, moral, ethical 
questions that you had. And I think that's another very common experience. And we've actually had another guest talk about that experience specifically. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Noah, Noah Rochetta. He runs the Secular Buddhism podcast. Um, so he, just to give some context, he grew up uh, Mormon, I think, and, and even married Mormon. And at some point had this crisis where he was like, look, the answers that these people are giving on these foundational questions of morality, I, I just don't think that's true. And he went on this whole adventure trying to answer these questions. And for him, the place that he landed was in a whole bunch of the teachings in a sort of secular uh, take on Buddhist philosophy was that the answers are not the important part. Asking the questions are the important part and how you ask and what you do in light of asking, like those are so much more important than the actual grounded answers. How do you, like, how do you philosophically approach some of those questions now, especially now integrating the, the heart, as you said, integrating the emotions and integrating any of the other philosophical experiences that you've had? What's your approach to those questions now? Yeah. Um, it's my approach to those questions. I think, um, well, one book that was influential to me <clears throat> was Letters to a Young Poet. I don't know if any of you have read that book. Um, it's about 100 pages. It's uh, 10 letters. Uh, I think it's Maria Rilke, I want to say is the name. I don't remember. But um, that was an incredible book. Um, and sort of my Bible, I guess, at that time. That, that, that sort of basically said the same thing, right? Um, really about, about asking and leaning into as opposed to um, feeling the need to know, the need to have the answers. Um, I mean, at, at this point in time, I'd say the, the, the principle, the first principle, at least for me, is, I, I guess you could say kind of existentialist, I suppose, um, just that I am human. I mean, I think it's, it's um, it doesn't matter what that word is, if it's human or if it's another language or if it's something completely different. But, um, you know, starting from that, I'm sort of defining from there. I define, um, I mean, let me back up. The question in my mind that I was wrestling with for a while was what should we be doing, right? Like what's, what's purpose? Um, or what is our purpose? What is my purpose? Is there one? And, um, and for that, I was struggling with what's my axiom? Like what's the thing that I'm starting with? Uh, that is non-religious, let's say, at the beginning. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's, it's sort of an observation, starting with an observation that I am human in the same way that, um, you know, a chair is a chair or a, um, uh, or a barnacle is a barnacle, right? Whatever it is. And, and, you know, is a barnacle trying to save the world? No, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, it's it's trying to do its little thing and um so in the same way that i'm human i think for me i sort of define uh, purposes as being human um which is sort of another conjugation of that verb right the same verb and not to say that that is everything that everybody has to be exactly the same uh in terms of how they define that and and to me i define what is good and what is bad essentially as if the action increases our ability to be human then that is good and if the action decreases our ability to be and when i say to be human that means um to allow us to have you know the freedom to do what we want to do um so this is nothing new i mean i know other people and other philosophers have sort of similar ideas i honestly don't have a rigorous background in, in formal philosophy almost at all i mean I, I dug into that stuff i dug into that world um deeply when i was 14 15 whatever around that time and i haven't really done so since um, mm -hmm. so I was not familiar with existentialism. I was not familiar with as well as these other things, um, but it makes sense to me. And I think uh, it allowed me a framework by which I am choosing whether I want to abide by that and whether I want, you know, whether I feel like I need to act for others um, or to stop others from doing you know, terrible things. Um, on the flip side, you know, something else is, is, is I do believe in God. You know, I believe when I, when I, when I, when I, what I mean by that is, um, what I mean by that is, is, is there is, um, it seems in, incredibly improbable to me that there are not 
other sort of dimensions of understanding, dimensions of comprehension or knowledge, right? So, so this is another thing. When I was a senior in high school, we were in a physics class, and we saw we saw a short film uh, called Flat World. I don't know if anybody of you have ever heard of Flat World. Um, I think it was in the '90s or something. Uh, maybe 80s, but basically it, the film was about 20 minutes or something like that, it was very short. But it essentially was the story of, um, it was the story of, of a of world that was completely flat, right, two dimensional. And there were, um, you know, little lines and squares and whatever different shapes on this world. And they went about their day and they did their business. And then uh, there were, one day there was a 3D object, a sphere, right, that intersected on this plane of the two-dimensional object, the two-dimensional world. And if, you know, then it's like, whoa, it hits you, right? Like, at least it hit me, which was, what do those two-dimensional shapes see, right? They don't, they can't comprehend what that sphere is. They only see the circles, right? That, because that's, that's the, the cross-section of the sphere. And so they'll never understand that entirely different dimension. And to me, that's a perfect analogy, right? There is, to, to believe that we as human being, adult human beings, by the way, not just human beings, adult human beings, right? Because think about it, also kids, kids don't have the same dimension of comprehension or, or, or knowledge, right, that adults do, right? They see, they see different things differently. Animals don't have the same as a human, or rocks don't have the same as us, right, in different capacities. And so why would we, why would I believe that we, there's no reason to believe that we're the top of it. Hmm. And, so to me, it's like a 99.9999% chance that there are other dimensions of knowledge or of comprehension. And more than that, I see evidence that that's true, right? So, so I see evidence that that's true because I believe we see second order effects, right? Of those kind of intersecting in our, in our plane, so to speak. Um, and, and some of those are um, things like uh, mathematics, right? Sort of dividing by zero, things like infinity concepts, right? That we can sort of see the effects of it, but we actually can't wrap our minds around it. It's just literally not possible. Um, ideas like the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. I actually took an entire astrophysics course in college specifically to try to understand the beginning of the universe. Like that was the one thing I was curious about. And so I spent all this time in the office hours as this professor. And basically my takeaway from that course was astrophysicists can dig into like the negative one to the negative 30 second of what happened, right? But like the very beginning, nobody ever knows. <laughs> and I think there's a difference between concepts that are, incompre are uncomprehensible or incomprehensible um, versus ones that we can comprehend but that we don't know right yet. Um, now the counter argument to this is you could say throughout history there have been things that we thought were not comprehensible that we eventually comprehended. Um, and perhaps that's true, but I think that there's, there are some that are real and there are some that are not in terms of, of, of that. So anyway, so th those are a couple examples of reasons why I believe that. And I, and I also believe that that ties into what I mentioned earlier around sort of being human. I think a lot about, um, yeah, I mean, we can dig in more, but that's, that's yeah, no, that's, that's good. So uh, yeah, I, I love this stuff. I, I really love to understand some of the philosophical foundations that people are operating on and how that informs their approach. And so, uh, you know, I really want to get into your ideas on education and specifically why you started shift up and what the principles are behind that. So maybe you could give us the, the beginning of shift up and uh, yeah, what <laughs> principles are behind it? How did you well, launch this? Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hear a lot of commonalities. So so shift up actually began as a nonprofit that was designed to be a gap year program for low income students. So this was actually the very the first part of my two things that I care about. Right, one is sort of helping people figure out who they want to be as individuals. Mm -hmm. That was what we started on. Um, so and and this was this was I I had moved I quit my job in San Francisco from. I don't know, it was like maybe October, November, 2016. I moved back to Detroit around December. I injured my leg, I tore my ACL. And then I started, I came back one day hobbling on my crutches and I was like, I'm gonna start a nonprofit because I knew what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I was in this cold apartment in Detroit. And um, 
I basically was trying to figure out what what problems can I help with in the workforce system, right? Like, like because that, that was my area of expertise was sort of job training, higher education, innovation. And um, the thing I always heard was from, I had read lots of reports. I talked to lots of people on the ground. I talked to lots of executives. I talked to families, all these things, was that when it comes to getting people jobs, people who I wanted to serve, people I wanted to serve were those who I believed were basically shut out of the system in many ways, right? People who had been trapped, uh, I, I, and I, that, that's a, yeah. And um, the, the, the thing that I heard was, was it's, it's almost never the technical skills that are the challenge to teach. It's almost always the non-technical skills, right? Especially for folks who are tip, more typically coming from first-gen backgrounds, low-income backgrounds, things like this. And um, I mentioned I, I've been a part of the scout troop, which is essentially a leadership development program, right? So I had essentially seven years of leadership development training with a graduate instructor as our coach, basically. Um, so I had this unique way, or I had this perspective, which was like, could we build essentially like a condensed scout troop experience and sort of prepare people for technical training? Um, so essentially like a, a, a pre boot camp where that was focused on soft skills and leadership development. Anyway, long story short, um, I was going to use that type of training um, that evolved. So I was doing that for three, three, four months that evolved. And then I decided let's, let's focus on kind of 18 to 24 year olds, 16 to 24 year olds. I cared about them a lot. A third of them, by the way, a third of, of 18 to 24 year olds or 16 to 24 year olds in Detroit are not in school and not working. Okay, so they're sort of out. They're called opportunity youth, or um, there's another word I'm forgetting. Um, anyway, and that, that number is the same across across the country in, in both big cities and often rural areas, right? At 30 to 40 percent. So that was a big problem. I went on the street and talked to people, and I said, okay, like, why are you not in school? Why are you not working? Like, let's dig into this. And I talked to maybe 40, 40, 50 people. And the one thing that struck me, which was there were certainly people who talked about, I don't have money or I don't, I don't have, um, uh, well, you think you're going to get a job, but that I don't have transportation or I have child, you know, kids to take care of or family or something else. Um, but, but that was actually a minority, right? Like maybe 50% or, or more when it got down to it, they told me that they, they felt almost hopeless. They felt like they didn't know why they didn't know what they were doing or why they should be doing anything. And that's not limited, right, to low-income students, right? This is the same problem with, with rich kids, right? This is the same problem with lots of people. I mean, there's a huge crisis in many ways. Uh, so what I thought was, okay, if, if you were working with students who could afford it, what would they do? They would probably go take a gap year. They probably would go travel the world or do something else to kind of figure themselves out, so to speak. And, uh, but you can't do that with this demographic. So for me, I actually started by saying, could we combine a gap year experience with an apprenticeship and actually teach students these, these kids skills that they could use to earn money to basically pay for the program. And, and then my, uh, I had to say, well, you have to start somewhere. The whole idea about the lean startup is, is you need to sort of, for those of you who don't, who don't know anything really about sort of startups 101 and entrepreneurship is, um, you know, start small, start quick, do fast iteration and see if you can get something started. So Nobody really wanted to be my technical co-founder <laughs> because I didn't really have an idea. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, so I, I said, let's, let's, let's run a, a summer camp, like a, a week-long, two-week summer camp. And I didn't have anybody who was going to teach these kids how to code because nobody wanted to do that with me. And so I didn't know how to code, by the way. I don't know how to code. I studied public policy in school. Um, but I actually, this is where the principle came in, which is one of the principles of Shift Up is don't reinvent the wheel. Like there are, there's so much online content available that is getting better and better every day. That content is becoming a commodity. So training programs, the vast majority of them should not be creating content. You should be curating content. And so that's what we did. We curated content for these, for these eight students, 16, 17, 18. And I literally had them come to a classroom and teach themselves how to code. I didn't know how to code. And we had uh, coaches who were available from uh, periodically on a screen who could help them. And these kids who often have serious attendance challenges, don't come to school, often do this kind of thing. They showed up every single day the entire time, built multiple projects, had a fantastic time, and unanimously asked me to run it again the next month. So I did. We had some pretty strong results again. 
And um, I, I'll fast forward, I know it's taking a long time. But the, <laughs> the, uh, basically, I ended up fast forwarding and then I, I realized end of summer, I took a little bit of time to myself, uh, a few weeks, traveled a little bit and came back and said, okay, this is cool, we have something here, but this could actually be a lot bigger. This could be like a modern community college system, right? Uh, we, we figured out something. And, um, and I also realized that there were a lot of challenges that there were working for myself with, with uh, students from these backgrounds that it wasn't impossible for me to surmount, but it would be, it would be very difficult, right, to, for me to connect on exactly the same level. I think that the mentorship component could be better used by others who are, who are closer with them. So anyway, we, I ended up pivoting it. We ended up starting to serve adults in the fall, uh, ran a bunch of workshops, and we basically gathered enough people who started to pay by January of 2018. And I started launching our first adult training program in January 2018 with about 12 people. Uh, they paid me 250 a month, roughly, uh, 150, 250 a month. And they started teaching themselves to code. They worked at a co-working space, same sort of deal. We had our first people start to get jobs after five months, part-time, about 15, 20 hours a week. This was our first one. It was incredible. I mean, this was, this was a gentleman, his name, I don't know if I should say his name. Uh, but basically, no, 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 he, he had dropped out of Eastern Michigan. Uh, after a few years, never finished his degree, ended up um, as a bagger. He was a bagger uh, at, at Bush's and, uh, or retailer. And um, he worked his ass off and he got a job in five months part-time and doubled his income and is still with us today and just got a promotion and other things, right? So this stuff is real. It can help. It can change people's lives. And um, he's just one, right? One of many. So, so that was incredible. Um, basically, four months in, I ran out of cash. Like, I didn't have much savings at all. Um, you know, was burned through all that, burned through 15K in credit card debt, and um, uh, was literally, like, struggling for $100 here, $500 there, like, kind of scrounging for donations. So, still a nonprofit at that time. And that kind of killed me. I was still working part-time, working another, another job. And um, it was, it was, like, kind of claw for little bits of money here and there up until October. I mean, we, we shut down, we nearly shut down a few times. And then October had somebody finally give me a combination of A, we turned for profit. So we converted from a nonprofit to a for profit. Uh, we can talk about that if you want. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, somebody gave me a small investment. So I quit my job. And uh, it turns out that investment didn't come through like fully. That person, that's, uh, I don't want to get into that, but it was um, not a good situation and um, started to get on a track where I wanted to go raise a real amount of money, not just like $5,000, but like, let's go raise half a million. And um, that took forever. <laughs> I think I, didn't, I had no idea how hard that was gonna be. Uh, we had like six, seven months of that, eight months of that. Um, also almost shut down again. And um, anyway, I probably rejected about 200 times from investors, you know, more. Um, and then we launched officially in October. <laughs> so, so last October, we launched a first place downtown Detroit. Uh, we now no longer just do web development. We also do digital marketing. We do user experience design, Unity game development. We now have just shy of 50 members, active paying members right now. Um, and what a learning gym really is, is we're providing people with curated resources and projects into stuff we call roadmaps, learning roadmaps. So you have a structure to follow. You have coaches. Right, so you have live coaches at least one night a week in different areas. Uh, you have your own personal trainer, somebody there to uh, keep you accountable and on track every week. You have community, right? Community of peers there to keep you, you know, motivated and, uh, and going forward. You have in normal times you have a physical study space, right, to come in and engage. You have live events, usually two live events a week, social, educational, networking events. You can you can purchase assessments and feedback. And finally, if you pass those assessments and feedback, you can get connected to employers. So these are sort of all these different pieces that we're rebundling at essentially, you know, a fraction of the cost of traditional uh, in-person education um, and hopefully an exponentially better experience than, um, than purely online by yourself banging your head against the wall. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you have answered this question many times because you preempted it. My next question was going to be, What's the difference between pure online and going to a learning gym? Like why, if you have a computer at home, has access to the internet, why bother? And you just laid it out. Like, go ahead. <laughs> well, yes and no, right? Because COVID has been a very interesting thing for us. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, right? So, so come March 13th, everything shut down in Michigan. 
uh, we moved online, you know, thinking, so actually my brother, by the way, is an epidemiologist. He's actually, he, he, he worked for the World Health Organization. Um, so it was like very interesting um, getting all that stuff in. But um, there was a big question mark as to whether our business would survive. <laughs> uh, especially because we were also scrapped for funds again. Um, but uh, we did. And actually, believe it or not, we, out of, we have, I think, maybe seven or eight, depending on how you slice it, different value propositions that we're bundling together. And out of those seven or eight, arguably five or six of them, you can you know, translate online effectively. Right? So the coaching, the roadmaps, the employer connections, the assessments, the, um, you know, the community to an extent, you know, et cetera. So there's different pieces. And we did it, right? So we did translate it online and really have a lot of success. So we've actually been growing at like 20 to 30% a month the last, the last uh, you know, three, four months, revenue's way up. Like, you know, we've been serving people all over the country, all over the world. Um, so it's very interesting. I think um, I might be wrong with my original thesis. <laughs> Uh, I, I, though I don't think so, right? I think there's a macro problem and a micro problem. I think the micro problem is specific within online learning retention. I think you can solve the online learning retention problem, which is relatively small, although it's still a massive, massive problem in many different ways. I think the macro problem is a totally different angle, which is loneliness in society, right? I think uh, isolation and loneliness, depending on how you measure it, is also at arguably crisis levels. I think that's do to many reasons. I think there's, um, you know, a weakening of relationships and sort of social fabric in society. I think part of that's due, um, you know, arguably the, the role of the decline of the importance in some cases of religion to many people. I think in many cases, um, the closure of retail and, and sort of malls and sort of third spaces in our lives where we interact and kind of make things. Um, so, so at its best, at its best, a learning gym, a physical learning gym, becomes a third space in people's lives. And so a third space, for those of you who don't know, is the basic idea is your first space and your second space are like the home environment and your work environment, right? Uh, third space is, is something outside of that that's primarily a sort of a social uh, type, of, type of environment. And we do, we, have, we now have people who have stuck on literally years beyond their initial goal of getting a job or doing whatever, and continue to pay us 150 a month, right, month over month, um, in large part, I believe, and I know for some of them, um, because of the community that we built, right? And that's gonna be difficult to replicate, but, um, but there's something very intrinsically tied, I would argue, between helping people feel alive, helping them feel respected, helping them feel fully human, and education. And so when education is done right, you are you're growing one's ability to be themselves right so sorry it's kind of a tangent but no i i think that's totally relevant because i mean that's the principle that is driving this whole thing that's the principle that informs your view of how to educate how to run an educational institution and i think you're right that the on one level the macro problem is not addressing the actual needs of a human being and what it takes to be a self-actualized human being. We're so focused on the technical skills in a lot of ways and in a lot of settings that a lot of that gets atrophied. You know, I think, I mean, listening to your story and you specifically use the word burnout as well. I think that is such a common feeling and I think part of that is because we're not focusing on those things. Uh, do you find that, uh, do you, so the people that, that take part in your program, do you call them students? Like, do you, or do you have some other term? Members, it's community, so. Mem okay, uh, actually, like that's gym. great. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that your members experience professional burnout in that same way? And, and maybe it hasn't been long enough or enough people, but do you find that they're, they're out in the world, uh, I guess, vulnerable to that burnout in the same way? Or do you think that the resources that you're providing and the context you're providing them is actually helping stave that off as well? I think 
I mean, I, th I think my, my particular experience of burnout was the, the cause was probably unique in some respects. I mean, I think um, just in the sense that like, I took a lot of things to the extreme, as you could probably tell from my story, like just from all these things, in the sense that, you know, the, my sense of purpose or like what I felt I had to be doing or I should be doing was external. And I think for many, many, many people, they also feel that something external. Usually that external bit, I would argue, is money or power or fame or something else, right? That you're sort of striving for. In my case, it was social impact, right? Like I had to maximize social impact and that was always something that I, to me, could never be achieved. And there was always more to do. And so because of that, I was, anytime I felt, felt anytime, anytime I was not actively doing that or, or optimizing, as Silicon Valley loves to use that term, optimizing for that, um, I felt like I was neglecting a duty in some ways to, to do that. Um, so in some respects, again, it was different in the sense of like the extreme to which I took it and that it was focused on social impact. But in many ways, it was similar. I would argue that a lot of people, again, prioritize money or power or fame and accumulation optimization. And, in, and by doing that, they sacrifice relationships with others and being just, just the, the ability to feel like um, satisfied in, on a daily level with their own lives, right? Um, I don't think that's the case with most of the people we're serving, right? I think most of the people we're serving don't really have the, many of them don't really have the privilege to even think about that, to be honest, right? Like, yeah. I, I think this is, I'm going out on a limb here a little bit, but, but I would argue, I, I think for a lot of folks, like we're serving a lot of folks who are um, retail or service, right? Uh, trying to, trying to kind of get out of that or unemployed or, but in many cases underemployed, right? These are, we're not really focused on corporate sort of professionals like moving up like that, right? That's just not who I'm interested really in serving and who we're gonna build this for. And so, but on the flip side, I'd say many people come to us and their jobs are drudgery, right? They're, they're, they're a janitor at a WeWork. They're doing, you know, they're doing something else that they feel like they're not seen, they're not heard, their, their skills are not being utilized and um, they don't, um, and we're giving them an out for that, right? A way to actually learn a skill that can, that can um, help them feel that. I think everybody wants to be seen. I think everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be respected. Um, and in some ways, I would also argue our brand and sort of the company that we're building is going against the grain in some capacity from like typical SaaS companies, software companies, or other sorts of things where many typical scalable software companies they do the opposite of helping you feel seen, right? They make you feel unseen. They make you feel like you're uh, this tiny little speck that, that a robot's going to help you with. For us, it's, it's much more service. It's like, we're going to get to know you. We're going to be the equivalent of a doctor, right? In terms of your relationship over the course of your life. But we're focused on helping you build skills. And, and skills is, by the way, just the tip of the iceberg. Like for me, I want these to be self-improvement communities. I want these to be human aliveness communities, right? We could do cooking classes, we could do fitness classes, we could do um, all the non-technical skills that I mentioned, right? That we started with, we could pull those back in, which we're gonna do. Um, but you gotta take so, it one step at a time. Uh, this is eerie because again, you've preempted my question. The next question was literally like, what domains does this translate to? I mean, the way that I see it, this, what you've got going so far is technical skills that are essentially job prep. Right. And they're in the context of self-improvement and like you said, helping people figure out who they want to be and giving the freedom to you know, help them get there. Yes. But most of the time who people want to be is not just what they want to do. Right. Who they want to be is this whole, I, I love Scott Barry Kaufman's metaphor of the sailboat of self-actualization. Like it's got all these pieces and what you're doing, like your job, that may just be the mast of the sailboat or the sail of the sailboat. Yep. You, you got to put all the rest together. So how do you see that model translate to those other, other domains? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's actually the, it's the funniest thing about this whole journey. So this journey for me has been over about roughly three years, three and a half. I mean, if you talk about the time as a nonprofit, a time as, you know, whatever side project, it's been a side project. It was a side project for, over two years, I think, um, you know, it's only been about a, a year, year and a half since basically since I quit my job. 
um, is talk about lean into the questions and not be concerned about the answers, right? Mm -hmm. It's that's, I feel like that's a core tenant of entrepreneurship. Um, and investors never get that. <laughs> they think you have to get it all figured out. Yeah. But, um, but to answer your question, I mean, um, I, I, my best guess at this point is that the services will probably be kind of like an onion or right? in the sense where and I go back to this onion. I know I said that once before. It's funny. Um, but basically there will be the most marketable in demand skills. We will be able to staff with live coaches, right. And probably the in-person ones. So those might be like the top 10, right. Something like that. So you can do Monday through Friday, Saturday, you know, three sessions on Saturday, three sessions on Sunday. Um, beyond that, you might have another 20 that, um, the next 20 most in demand subjects and we'll probably have online coaches that could serve anybody around the country or the world at any time. And then there'll be a huge long tail, right? Uh, like on Coursera, you know, I don't know how many courses there are, but there's a ton, but it's a, you know, it's like this, right? So, mm -hmm. so we will certainly welcome people who want to come and be a member of this community and, 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 and we do have people, by the way, we have, we have several people who, who do stay just for the community and the enrichment from the live events, even without the coaches, because they don't have a coach for their specific area and they'll still pay for it, which is pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, my goal would be to expand those layers of onions, right? Like eventually. So it becomes like the Amazon of aliveness. I don't know. <laughs> or, um, <That's> <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be, we're going to have some large program that helps people explore and figure out what they want to do, and who they want to be. There's going to be a technical side to help them get the technical training and there's going to be a non-technical side, right. To get, so it's kind of like a up reverted pyramid in some ways. Um, so we're, we're, we're building those out. Um, I think when you can pull those together and then if you can ideally create, you can imagine these could become also little incubators, people could start companies, right? Which is in some ways a pinnacle of some, some of this stuff. Uh, there could be art, you know, art, music. I mean, like, I'm not gonna, I don't think we're gonna get there, to be honest. I don't think we're gonna have like a giant art music thing. Maybe, maybe <laughs> someday, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll have to make sure after this to uh, make sure that you've got Shrikant's contact info because I mean, essentially what, what we've been doing with the meetup uh, the last couple of years and you know he's the the primary force behind that i'm i'm just the backup is creating somewhat of uh, an analogous community i mean it, it's not monetized at least not in the same way uh but a community centered around self-actualization where you know the technical skills are th that's not our focus our focus is essentially the rest of it is making sure that you know, ideas matter, right? They do. Ideas absolutely matter. That's how you live your life. And so it's important to make sure that you've got the right ideas. And I don't mean right as in, you know, factually correct. I mean, right as in they're the most useful for you. They're tested against other ideas. They've, they've been in the battle space of ideas. And, you know, you've actually had a chance to examine them. Yeah. And that's what our community is focused on. So I'll have to make sure that you guys link up because I think that in terms of expanding your community, uh, yeah. there's a lot of wisdom to share there. And my, so, my hope, my hope is that the vision, right. Is for every neighborhood to have a learning gym. Yeah. Right. I, I want to see this eventually scale. It's not going to be all us or there'll be other competitors. I'm sure. Uh, I don't really care. Like we're going to beat them in, <laughs> in many ways. I mean, but it's, it's not, what does it, what does it mean to be beat? I, that's a, you know, uh, and by the way, just just to add your what you just mentioned, right? The, that that ideas matter. That's a it's it's a weird subject for me a little bit. Um, I totally agree with you, by the way. But but uh, there was somebody in my life who who I respected a lot that um, vehemently argued the opposite, and that really hit me hard in the wrong way. I think, but it it, it also it also spurred me to get better at execution in, in order to actually, and to be clear, I do believe ideas matter. And I think the idea that only execution matters is bullshit, right? I think you can change the world in many, in many different ways. Um, and, and I think it was, it's harmful to argue otherwise, but the, um, 
Uh, anyway, that's just a small, small thing. <laughs> but yeah. it's actually probably a thing. <laughs> what do you think has been the biggest shift in your perspective since, you know, in this last three-year journey? Uh, what's changed your mind? What was different than you expected? Hmm. Um... I mean, I can tell you a few things. One, changing from a nonprofit to a for-profit. I mean, I think um, my whole attitude towards business capitalism in general um, has shifted significantly. Um, in what way? I think when I started out, I didn't really want to have a part. Uh, like, I, I, I thought <clears throat> I should be able to articulate this better. But I think... Um, it's okay. This is a space where you're you're absolutely allowed to think out loud. And... <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't believe in capitalism at the beginning in, in some capacity. I didn't think it was the right, like you talked about doing the right thing, right? Like I, I felt there were better other ways to, to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. I, I thought that, I, I, I thought, I believed that profiting through a system in, in, in this kind of way was, um, was exploitation right, in, in a certain capacity. Uh, I no longer believe that. Uh, there's, so there's, I, I think I, I changed for two reasons. One was the practical reason, which was trying to operate through the nonprofit system was a pain in the ass for me. It was um, my, my personality uh, at that time, even at this time, I don't think is a good fit. Like I think I was, I was changing at lightning speed, right? Our strategy and like you had to, if you were gonna do grants, you know, you had to put it in and you have to wait six months and nine months. I had no way to do that, right? So, so there was a practical reason for that. Uh, and just the mindset of operating it in a traditional nonprofit versus a for-profit. And then the second one was philosophical again, which was more around, um, uh, yeah, I, I just no longer buy those same arguments that I believed earlier. Um, again, around exploitation, around what is value, how is it, direct, how is it perceived, um, and, that, and that I don't think that, you know, I think as long as you are creating and capturing value, like you can, you can run a business in a way that's immoral, right? And you can run a business um, uh, in a way that's not. Um, so I, I don't think it's just the business itself. Um, that being said, I do deeply believe in, in the need for broad systemic change. Like to me, the, the business is a, um, this particular project, I would call it a project, is a way to, um, for me to experiment really and to, to figure out sort of what works and what how to make how to build something better that we can create systemic change with um and systemic change can be done in multiple ways um but you know um sorry i lost my train of thought you were um systemic change and um oh yeah and then the, the capitalism thing so yeah, I mean, I, I think I think now, um, I think when we talk about loneliness, when we talk about isolation, I think these are second order effects, right, or, or first order effects, I suppose, how you define it, of of systemic problems. I don't I don't think these are like small things that you can, uh, you know, fix with a new fab, um, and and so that, that's a level deeper than what we're doing right now with with this business that you know should this business succeed will be succeeding within the system. So it's complicated, but. Uh... Yeah, but you know, on some level, at least in my mind, that kind of systemic change is made up of individuals who affect their immediate community and then their broader community and so on, and inspire other individuals to start doing the same as nodes in a network. I mean, we talked a couple of weeks ago uh, with, a woman, Rupali Sharma, who runs a Montessori school. And one of the questions that Alex was asking her was about why, why this isn't the, why Montessori isn't like the yeah. base <laughs> from which people start with education and then go, okay, I'm going to take the Montessori model and then I'm going to change something and experiment. Instead, we've got this industrial model of education that, you have to depart from yeah. and you know, why isn't Montessori the base? Well, there are a lot, a whole lot of reasons for that, but at the end of the day, if a new model of education at that level is going to come into play, it's going to be 
it's going to come into play because enough people have looked at other models of education that they can start to implement change on a small, then larger, then larger, then larger yeah. scale. Yeah. And I think in your case, it seems like that's, that's the path. I don't it know is. if that analysis resonates with you. It is, it is. And I'll add, you know, my, my thoughts on a lot of these things are continually evolving, right? Including with, with capitalism. I don't think it's set in stone for me. I think I'm constantly trying to better understand how, how things can work. Um, the, um, you know, I think it's a very interesting time as well. Some of you probably are more familiar with this than others. Those of you who are parents, um, there's been a large upswing in, in, in uh, I don't know if upswings, uh, a growth in discussion around um, basically one room schoolhouses or micro schools or homeschooling uh, given COVID and given, given what's going to be happening this fall. I, I don't know if that, I haven't had my ear enough to the ground, even though I am very close to know whether that's actually trickling down, to, so to speak, to, um, you know, everyday people, right? Like, like uh, you know, um, just, just, or whether actually, that's something that's kind of, yeah, well, go ahead. I was going to say, that's actually what I'm doing day to day. Okay. I, I, my fiance and I are, have been, I don't want to get into too much detail, but we've been running or co-running uh, like a little homeschool pod cool. for the, uh, two to four year olds. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and that will be very interesting. I actually know somebody, a founder who started a startup in the homeschooling space literally months before COVID hit. And so they just nailed it on the timing. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, to, I mean, to answer your question, I forget what we were saying. Oh, I remember. Um, yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Is it, is, is this going to be a moment in time that's going to give public schools a run for their money, right? In some capacity, you know, what's good about that, bad about that. Um, so in some ways, can that create systemic change? Yes. Um, in other ways, do you need real policy change? Yes. Right. It's interesting. So. Yeah, for sure. So can you talk a little bit more about your response to COVID? Like how, how have you guys adapted in light of lockdown? Yeah. Um, so some of this I touched on earlier, but I'll, I think there's a bit more we can go into. The, well, a good chunk of our cost is the physical space. So, you know, we, we were on a month to month contract. We were working out of a co-working space so we could cut that, which was good. Um, which actually means we could be profitable pretty, pretty darn soon, which is actually amazing. Um, but um, yes, so we moved everything on. So, that, so we, if you were to join us right now, let's say you wanted to learn um, user experience design or something like that, right? You, you join us, we have an onboarding process where we're gonna walk you through all this and we're gonna get to know you really deeply, really well, kind of what your needs are. Um, we then give you a roadmap, which is again, curated resources. So we don't create that. The other people spend millions of dollars creating that. We don't have to deal with it, which is amazing. So we curate the resources that are free and open. We add our own projects as necessary. Um, and you're starting to make your way through this roadmap at your own pace. You check in every week on Monday with me or somebody else who's kind of a accountability person, your personal trainer. You're going to set goals for the week. You're going to reflect on the previous week. You're going to, um, uh, you can come out to any, it's kind of all you can eat membership. So you can actually join us for any of the programs that we're doing, coding, design, marketing, whatever. And you uh, come out during your, the UX design session. And it's kind of like a mix of like office hours meets study group, right? So you have, you have an expert professional there who's there to answer questions, but you've already done a lot of the studying on your own. Other times people will actually kind of just block off those two or three hours during the office hours and use it like, a study group, right? So they'll actually just go through the curriculum while the coach is there and they'll ask questions and they get stuck. Um, we do live events two to three times a week, as I mentioned, and then um, you can get assessments, feedback, connected to employers, uh, life is good. Um, you know, we may, we're experimenting with a number of new models. So we're trying to do some rapid iteration and testing. I think it's, there's some really interesting models like Weight Watchers that we're sort of, I'm, I'm looking closely at to see you know, what are the pieces of our product that give people the most value and what pieces do, are not necessary? Um, we're looking at CrossFit, right? We're looking at, like, there's a bunch of interesting things out there that we're going to experiment with. Um, 
you know, we're, we're, we're also selling not just directly to individuals, but also to major online learning providers. So like some of the largest online college systems in the country, uh, uh, when we have physical spaces, the idea is that we can provide them with co-learning spaces for their students. We're rolling out a pilot with Coursera, right, um, which is pretty awesome for us. And a number, we got another huge number of people in the, in the pipeline, which we're good. But yeah, in terms of anything else that's changed, um, I think it's, it, there's, an, there's an open question in my mind as to out of any hundred people, how many of those hundred really want and need and benefit from the physical community, right? And the physical space and community, how many benefit from live synchronous sort of learning and, and like what we're doing right now and how many can just get by with what they do today, which is like a, a MOOC on Coursera, a massive open online course, which is for those of you who don't know, Cor probably, probably you all know Coursera is <laughs> talking to a, a crowd that probably knows. Um, so as you know, it's only a tiny chunk of people. You're talking less than 5% who succeed on a Coursera course. Uh, there's some unknown that would succeed in what we're doing now. I think what I've been realizing is that that number is actually probably a lot larger than I expected. Um, and then there's some chunk of people that really want and need and benefit from the in-person. Uh, so that's the main change, I think, is those two distributions have, have gotten different. Okay. Are there any other topics that, what's something that we haven't hit yet that you think is worth talking about? Um, I mean, I was, it's probably related to my off topic, so I think we, we could probably jump into that, but let me think if there's anything else, uh, that's important. In, in the meantime, Alex, as well, if you've got any questions, it's, uh, it's your time to jump into. Ray's been beating me to him too, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's eerie, right? <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, in that case. I say let's jump into the off topic. So for anybody who's new to the switch and may not have heard this before, the off topic is a chance we give our guests to uh, take a break from things they may be tired of talking about over and over and over and bring up some topic as long as it's not directly related to the main topic. Um, it can be anything serious or lighthearted. Philosophy uh, doesn't have to be, it could be a book recommendation something someone said to you in line at the grocery store, really anything. And we'll spend a couple of minutes on it. And then uh, for the audience, we will go into Q&A. So go ahead and either stick your questions in the chat or like Joseph just did, uh, put a little exclamation point and we will get to you guys. So Ray, off topic, what do you have for us? So I've got uh, two things. Um, one, which is more lighthearted, one's a little bit more serious. Um, the lighthearted one, will be something that happened this morning, which was I slept in because I had a late night and I woke up and started getting ready, I don't know, 10 or 11. I usually work from about 10 to 10 roughly. So I'm, I'm you know, but I'm kind of taking some breaks between them because we have classes in the evening, our classes are in the evening. Um, but anyway, I actually tweeted about this today, um, but I, I put on some music and I was listening to Vampire Weekend. Some of you might know Vampire Weekend, the band, some of you may not. But anyway, it was just such a good jam. And I was just, like, I didn't have a shirt on. I was just like, it was just me in the house. Started dancing by myself. <laughs> and like I was like, a movie. I was like, this, to me, at that exact moment in time, I actually, I woke up to a very nasty message on a text that basically had me in a, in a bad mood. Um, and it just made me think that, like, at, at that moment in time, I was like, dancing like this is more effective for me than meditation. Mm. I was just like, um, I didn't really touch on this. I, maybe we should have touched on it potentially, but I have had my own journey with meditation in, in many different types and forms. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, so, so, so at that moment in time for me, it was like just like purely dancing and joy and like the endorphins from that it was like, wow, this just got my day on an amazing start more than I have 98% of the time felt with meditation. So that was just something to think about. Nice. Um, we can you, let's okay. take that for a second. Oh, were you okay. about to go into more of that or the no, other? One? I was okay. the other one. I want to take that one because the fact that you mentioned meditation, Alex and I, I could feel both of our <laughs> ears perked up. That's a that's a common topic for us. There's a whole meditation day in the Fifty Two Living Ideas meetup. Uh, so, what has your experience been with meditation? And well, yeah, let's let's just start with that, and we'll we'll do it sure. quick. And I want Alex to chime in as well. 
Sure. And, and I, I need to obviously caveat that meditation as a single term is, is obviously um, uh, way more nuanced than just one word. But um, I guess my journey or my experience with it, um, I have tried, um, I don't know, probably a, a large handful of different uh, types and methods um, of meditation over the years. I think I probably have had three significant periods in my life when I kind of tried more significantly. Um, one was sort of early college and then post and up late college and then um, in and post San Francisco into Detroit uh, for me. Um, the, 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 the method that I use that resonated most deeply with me and sort of helped me the most was a form of Sahaj Mark meditation, um, which is, it was basically uh, um, rebranded as, as far as I understand as heartfulness. I don't know if, if there's any familiarity there, but um, as opposed to, to mindfulness, and uh, I think um, I don't, I'm not an expert by any by any means, um, but um, to me it was a tool. It was more of a means to an end. I think rather than an end of itself. More, eh, I don't know if I would say that actually. It had different different effects for me at different times, but essentially I, I had. Um, I think I think. I entered, I started doing meditation in part because I was trying to fight what I believe is sort of a natural personality trait for myself, um, which is what many people might call like a jumpy mind sort of thing, you know, kind of always leaping from one thing to the next. And I, um, I, I think today there are certainly specific instances where it overcomes me and, and that kind of takes control in some capacity. But I, I think I've actually, I've accepted it much more and I've um, moderated it much more to the point where as long as I can really keep what I believe is the big picture in mind for myself and in heart and emotion and sort of bring my energy from up here down to more here or like my focus, um, I, feel good and um uh and um and can continue to be to do what i want to do and to be who i want to be um so anyway i guess what i'm saying is the the heartfulness piece in in some cases i think i stopped it really when i started therapy last fall and i think for me and i, I only i started therapy because i was broke for like two years and i literally couldn't do it before that which is kind of a shame but um but i only started after i got investment after literally years of nothing but um anyway so, so so since i since i did that um that sort of replaced it for me and then i i don't know i i, I want to have it some somewhere in my mind as long as i feel in moderation as long as i feel um in a good place i don't feel a, a need right now to do it whereas a year ago i would have said it was a regular practice that i that i need yeah so it's things change yeah sure and I was doing like, you know, there were times when I was doing 90 minutes a day type of thing. And, um, and now I know minutes isn't everything, but, um, but I was serious about it. That's kind of what I mean to say. Yeah, I definitely also go through periods of that. I feel like I kind of need to clear the junk out, you know, yeah. just let my mind process it and get it out. And there's other times I feel like where therapy is a more needed thing because it, it need more of a reflecting board, you know, that just sitting and, and really, my mind doesn't have all of the necessary ingredients itself to make process it all. And that's when I think therapy and other stuff comes in for me personally. And then other times I feel like my mind is doing okay, but my body's energy. And then it's like you said, dancing or, you know, not for me, like exercise in some way. Yeah. And but meditation for me was the thing that allowed me to realize that there were all these different kind of needs I had and, that just one thing like why isn't exercise fixing everything it's you know there's other stuff i got to take care of like a in the game the sims fulfilling all those little meters keeping those up and it's not always the same thing so i, I that resonates agreed yeah awesome yeah for me meditation i mean i've, I've told the story on the podcast probably twice maybe three times of how I started meditating and some of the benefits for me. So just to keep it short, uh, I, I mean, I find meditation to be just another component in the 
the self-actualization transcendence sailboat that is now my favorite metaphor that I keep coming back to. It's like, it's, it's just another piece that keeps the sailboat operating properly. And there are times when it seems like you don't need that piece. And in, in my mind, the way that I maintain my sailboat, I'm going to keep it operational just so that, you know, when that perfect storm comes along, I, I know how to use it. I know that it's in my arsenal. I know that the, the skills that it uh, provides to me and the, the, that component is in good working order, even when the more instrumental, uh, you know, immediate use is not necessary at the time. Yeah. Um, that's just how I run my ship. Nice. I freaking love that metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. So uh, I'm just, just for curiosity, curiosity's sake, we won't spend as much time on it, but I was, I'm curious what your other off topic was before we move to questions. Sure. So the other off topic is slightly off topic, but it's, it's related. Um, which is, remember how I talked about sort of macro micro problem, right? Mm -hmm. That we're trying to solve. And I would, I, I believe that, um, many trends, many, I don't know if trends is the right word, but yeah, I guess it is. Many trends and um, events that we see and that we've seen over the last, hmm, I don't know, five, 10 years do actually at, at its core reflect um, this, this sort of, I guess, loss of um, uh, meaning or purpose or sort of, or I think people kind of grasping in many ways right now not just me, not just sort of really intellectually or sort of abstractly, but um, specifically, you know, when we talk about what seemed like crazy events t for most people of Andrew Yang, uh, of Trump, of um, Justin Bieber and Kanye saying uh, that they're going to no longer do popular music that's, that's um, that they're only going to do secular music, or sorry, what is basically only religious music right, uh, for certain times, uh, opioid crisis, right, loneliness, like all these things, um, mental health crises, um, they're all related in my view. Um, and I actually had, <laughs> my, one of my random facts is uh, Andrew Yang actually came to a bar in Detroit about two years ago, and that's where I met him. <laughs> nice. And so he was, <laughs> I had like a 30 minute conversation with him at a bar in Detroit. At the very end, he's like, oh yeah, and I'm running for president. And he's like, I just quit my job running for president. And uh, this was like two, three years ago. And I was like, of what? Like president of what? <laughs> he literally like pulled out a business card that he had just scratched off his, his old thing. It's so funny. But anyway, I think we, um, yeah. And, and so, you know, when I see, in some cases, startups or other sort of band-aid fixes in many ways, right? Trying to kind of go after a mental health crisis or opioids or whatever. It's, it's like trying to stop a, a gaping wound with a band-aid, right? It's like, um, and in many ways, this is kind of the challenge with like philanthropy and capitalism, right? Like there's, there's certain, um, I don't know. I mean, these are all, these are ongoing thoughts that I'm sort of spurting out, right? That I don't have completely fleshed out, but but I, I deeply do believe that um, one of the core challenges of our of, of the next how many years and now is going to be how do we strengthen the, the, the fabric of community? How do we strengthen the fabric of relationships uh, yeah. now? And is that how do we do that in a systemic way? I think what I'm doing right now arguably could be systemic at some point, but like but it's not. I think it's this. I think it's more of a proof of concept in some ways that that will become huge. Don't get me wrong. Like I want there to be thousands of these things, um, and um, so it's kind of a random thought. But uh, I think we're just seeing a lot of a lot of people. Um, we're seeing the expression of I think of a lot of the same type of things that I was experiencing myself. Yeah, I think just to end on a positive note i think that the place that that leaves us is opportunity there's opportunity to fill those gaps with amazing incredible things and people who have ideas can execute on them and they'll help solve this crisis of meaning and, and in my mind that's awesome 
you know, I, but I'm, I'm an optimist, I guess. I am too, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and get to some audience questions for the, uh, the end here. So again, for the audience, if you've got questions, go ahead and stick them in the chat. We will come to you. A uh, couple of rules to keep in mind, as always. First of all, please be brief. Uh, stay on topic and be courteous. Courtesy means feel free to disagree with things, but understand that uh, this is not a place to hurl insults. Um, and then lastly, we won't do any back and forth. So once you ask your question, we'll go ahead and mute you and that'll be that. And so we will start with Tanya or Tanya. Go ahead and ask your question. Actually, I'm not sure that she just Tanya is still here. Yep. Okay. So next will be Joseph Bullock. Hi, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. It's really been awesome. It's been fantastic, actually. They're just listening to you, and like, there's so many ideas that are going through my head, the possibilities of this. Um, you mentioned you had seven or eight value propositions, uh, that, which is actually allows you to pivot pretty easily. Um, one, what are your top two? And have you thought about maybe targeting specific problems with community? Meaning like whether it be a prison system or whether it be autom uh, jobs that are being automated because those are natural communities because they have shared experiences so that they're, you know, that's a way of kind of creating a natural way of, of community of learning that people are already in the same community. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and, and good to meet you. And thanks um, for that. Um, so the first part of your question, again, out of those seven or eight, what are the top two? Um, one would be the mentorship and the coaches right there, there. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> let's see. So what did I say? Sort of physical space, peer community, um, coaching, live events, personal trainer, um, feedback and assessments and employer connections. So yeah, I'd say the, the coaching piece of it. And then, uh, probably the, Um, I mean, I think the, I think the peer community in one way or another, right? That that means like that could be small groups of six to ten, you know, on, on online or something else. I think that plus the ability to get unstuck, right? Um, so those are those are two. Actually, take that back. I would say also the the learning roadmaps. You need to have a clear pathway to get to where you want to go. So I think it's that plus the coaching. I would argue. Um, and then your second question was around. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I just I lost target. No, basically targeted. Oh, yeah, targeted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So short answer to your question is, um, I certainly think that would work. I think that's probably even a better strategy. I think if I um, uh, do, we do that now. No, I think I think that that uh, that ship has sailed. If we're going to stay with the uh, the ship metaphors, <laughs> I think we're a little we're a little bit too past that at this point. I'm not going to like revert back and go just to one specific community. Though if I if I were recommending somebody to start this their, themselves. Um, yes, I would say start with one specific community and start with one thing. We start. We started with. We didn't start with one specific community per se, but we did start with one specific uh, skill, which was web development. And then, uh, yeah. Right. Does that target a problem, though? I mean, I don't mean to ask. Problem, no, that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> does it target a problem? So um, the. Yeah. Clarify. Oh. So basically, if it's targeting a problem. Yeah. Like it would naturally be like something like a uh, web development for a community oh. that is being automated out of a job. Like, so, you know, that's where. Yeah. We, we, we don't do that. So. Cool. All right. Next up is Sanjay. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I think this is fantastic what you're doing. I mean, you're really um, helping uh, underprivileged communities and, um, and they're oftentimes, uh, you know, left out, left out of the, the educational market. They they don't see a, a way that they can improve their lives. So this is this is really good. Um, the question I have is is I mean, and and it relates to what Joe just asked. That I actually had, kind of narrowed down your um, value propositions to two. And interestingly enough, I came up with, um, well, you you gave us three, and I came up with two of those three. I also included your mentoring coaches as as the top, 
um, value that you are offering. And I consider the peer community. Um, so basically, in my mind, what you're, the core of your service is, um, I mean, the simple way to explain it, because you're using a gym type of model, is you're providing a personal trainer for learning um, for job-based or personal-based skills. Um, and another way to say it is you're, you're providing a type of emotional hand-holding yeah. um, you know, and mentoring, which is very important. So the question really is, how can you scale this um, across, you know, I imagine you're going, you're planning to, to go beyond just a local area or, yep. or Michigan. Um, yep. state. So how do you plan to scale this? Um, near, near peer mentorship, right? So, so basically the, the, the goal here, the idea is to require, um, you essentially when people start, when they finish, they become the TAs, right? So you can kind of split this up into multiple, you can have like senior, senior people experts, right. That are available for office hours at periodic times. You can have, um, uh, like sort of mid-range sort of folks who have maybe three, five years experience, what have you, um, who are professionals uh, that are leading discussion sections from time to time, but then sort of the, the, the typical, um, the, 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 the part you need to scale is like the one-on-one mentorship, right? Which is obviously a tricky thing to do, but that you can, we, what we found is like 98% of the time, you don't need somebody who's got three, five, 10 years experience. You need somebody who's literally done it just before you have. Um, and so that can cover most of the things. And then you bring your more senior questions to the discussion sections, or, or if you need to, you can escalate it up the ladder, which is honestly not that much different than a standard college model of TAs and professors. Right. Um, I think it's just taking it arguably one step further and arguably streamlining that process to get rid of the bureaucracy, to be able to make it such that many, many students can become effectively TAs for others. Thanks, Sanjay. Next up is Zeno. Uh, hi. Yeah, I have a question about uh, community and education. And when we move college education to online, uh, there's something called the college experience, which may have a bad rap because it's associated with partying, etc. But there's also a core element of living in a dorm interacting with students of different backgrounds, different uh, career goals, different interests. And that's a value in college education. That's a, so how can we make that a value proposition in online education where you not have just community around, like somebody wants to learn coding, but uh, somebody wants to learn how to think, how to be a citizen, how to yeah. engage uh, romantically with other people. So is there, have you thought about this? Like, yeah. how can you do community online in education that is not just focused on a professional focus or learning a certain subject matter, but is a, is, part of what we expect in education to happen when you're there for four or five years, you yeah. grow in various ways and it's supported by all yeah. kinds of interaction on campus. Yeah, great, great question as well. Good to meet you. Um, the, so I am absolutely a huge fan of, uh, or, or I'm, I'm on the same wavelength, I believe, as you in terms of the value of everything you just described. Um, I would argue my NELP experience that I talked about earlier in this in this conversation was probably more than half the value I got right from my entire college education, um, and that was six weeks. The um, the ch I mean it, it's challenging. I, I'm not gonna. I think this is all like one step at a time. The end goal for me, at least with this, is I want to build an entirely new university system, right? Like, I, like this is a stepping stone. Like learning gyms are sort of one piece of this. And then eventually I want to build an entire, educa uh, entire higher education or higher education system. Um, for <clears throat> the, yeah, I, I think we're starting off with the quote unquote easiest things to do, which is uh, these technical skills, right? That for many individuals only require one question in the evening. In, in an entire evening of study, they might have one question for the instructor. The rest of it they can kind of do on their own, which is what we're seeing. Actually, it's very, it's very limited. 
but they they want the security of having a, a coach there to be able to that they can help if they need to. Um, obviously, that is not the case for many critical skills as human beings, whether that's around thinking critically or or well, I don't know how to answer this exactly. I think some of what you described, I believe, can be developed through what we're doing now, right? So critical thinking can be developed uh, in many cases by um, by project-based learning, right? When, when you add projects to the courses that we're, that we're doing and you're making students go out into their community and have these and they have to go back to their mentor. The, the one-on-one mentorship that we do is the main opportunity that we allow for more Socratic-like discussions, right? And sort of, and, and, and learning along that line. Um, that's what we actually tell our, our mentors. We, we, we instruct them how to, how to, the basics of sort of this type of methodology. Um, down the road, I would like to add, I, I would like to make these, as we talked about, communities to help people be alive, to be fully human, um, as a, almost a competitor to the school of, of life, right? I mean, as many of you might be familiar with uh, the school of life type of thing that could teach these others. But you can tell I'm beating around the bush. I don't actually know <laughs> the answer to what you're saying. Uh, I think we'll have to find out as we go. I think some of the questions may not be as scalable, quote unquote, or some of them may not be as, um, you know, they might not have the same cost advantages that we can do in other areas. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't offer them, right? I would say the other piece, well, no. Yeah, I, it's kind of an incomplete answer and I apologize, but I think it's to be to be determined. All right, and thanks for the question, Zeno. Um, all right, so that wraps up our Q&A. Unless anyone wants to get a last minute question in, go ahead and stick it in the chat while I say this part. Uh, Ray, if people are interested in following up with you, following up more with Shift Up, or you, know, you mentioned Twitter, I don't know if you wanna give that out, any place that you want people to connect with you, go ahead and pitch all of it. Uh, any links you mentioned, I'll stick in the show notes for the podcast side of things, but where can people find you? Sure, so I'm just putting in chat right now, the main website is www.shiftup.tech. That's S-H-I-F-T-U-P.T-E-C-H. Um, my email is just ray at shiftup.tech. Um, and my Twitter handle is, oh, we didn't talk about this. We should have talked about this is at Reese's and Coke Reese's like, like Reese's peanut butter cups and Coke, like Coca-Cola. Um, some of my two favorite things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So I think there's that you got my email, you got the website. Um, if you are interested in, um, coaching or mentoring, if you have a technical skill in these areas, right? Um, any of these digital skills, web development, uh, game development, digital marketing, user experience design, or if you or any friends or family or networks that you have may be interested, we have training programs for these. Um, they range right now from about $75 a month to $150 a month, they're on sale. Um, or just wanna follow up and just send me some questions. Happy to, happy to uh, respond to the best of my ability, so. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ray, for coming on The Switch. It was an awesome conversation. Glad to have had you. This was great. I appreciate you all and uh, good questions. And, and thank you, Chase. Thank you, Alex, and everyone else. Thank you. Cool. So with that, we'll go ahead and hand it back to Shrikant for the uh, wrap-up portion. And like I said at the beginning, Ray, you're welcome to stick around, hear uh, people's takeaways. Sure. Um, but this is where I'll cut off the podcast recording, and that's, that's what will get posted. So that, that was awesome. All right, folks, so now we are going to talk about what we got from this meetup. So uh, firstly, thank you very much, Ray. This was uh, wonderful. So let me go ahead and uh, I'm just going to, to do this in the order in which I see people. Um, if you do not want to share your takeaways, you can just type skip in the chat. So let's start with, uh, it's gonna be Dave, Joe and Zeno. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Rakan, and thanks for your presentation, Ray, and thanks to Chase and Alex. It's interesting to see a, a different system of learning. Uh, the 52 Living Ideas has been quite interesting to me, but offering a way for uh, people to get a leg up, uh, especially the unemployed or maybe underemployed, maybe suffering from uh, a black mark on the record or whatever, 
I'm glad that you are serving people and uh, hope you can keep it up. And uh, as Chase was uh, uh, recommending a little bit, or maybe Sanjay, uh, you know, learn how to branch out and, and grow. But to, good luck to you. Uh, thanks, Dev. Uh, okay. Next up is Joe. Uh, Joe, Sanjay, and uh, Joel. Joel, go ahead. Yeah, this this was really fantastic. I really thank everyone for joining us today. And that, I mean, I just love the story. I think that there are so many possibilities. Uh, the things that stuck out to me is that your ability to per, uh, persevere and pivot uh, and with your ideas. Um, and also the, the uh, addressing the loneliness issue is also, I think, critically important in society right now. Um, and the the uh, the ability to uh, again your um, that there's so many other this could be repurposed in so many different ways that you know it, it's going to grow it has a lot of ability to scale so I mean I, I think that this is a way of learn you know there are going to be things that you're going to probably run into and that you're probably going to like uh, maybe integrating different types of educational systems into what you're already using like a Montessori approach with learning gyms or something like that. I'm now I'm just thinking out loud, but um, I think that there are a lot of possibilities with this and uh, I wish you all the luck and I definitely wish to be in touch. Thanks. Uh, next up is Sanjay, Mike and Joel. Sanjay, go ahead. Yes, um, I, I had um, very, very similar ideas to what Joe said, that this is uh, very much scalable, and not only scalable, but I think the um, uh, the applicability, I mean, you're actually going to gain a lot more, um, uh, I mean, economies of scale, basically. Once you set up a core level of infrastructure in terms of content and um, um, uh, core uh, mentor group, um, that can be very easily applied across uh, across large um, geographic areas. Um, language is only um, differentiator, so you have to figure out, you know, um, I mean, probably you're focusing mostly on English speakers, so I don't think that'll be a problem for a long time. Um, I, I think, I mean, this is very important, again, because um, you are looking at uh, a population that is disadvantaged and a population that really is um, has been demoralized. And, and in one sense, you kind of mentioned this when you're talking about your, the micro problem right. and the macro problem, that uh, you know, a lot of the discontent, uh, especially in the US, but, but throughout Europe in most parts of the world, are geared toward um, the challenges that um, this population especially, but you know, basically every population has with um, their inability to rise and their inability to access um, a lot of uh, things in society you know, in particular education, and, and you're addressing one of the core um, elements um, in, in a fairly scalable and, and uh, robust way. It, it doesn't look like it's going to require a lot of um, capital investments. That That's a very positive sign. So thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, next up is thank Mike you. and then Joel. Joel. Mike, go ahead. Mike, are you there? Okay. Uh, next up is Joel. Joel. All right. Uh, next up is Alex. Alex, what what are you walking away with? I just think it, it really helped to clarify what was missing with online education, right? Like I've taken classes and, and there always seemed to be a retention and, and just something different that struck me about it in college. And I think, you know, Ray answered that really with the community and, and just throughout the discussion I was thinking about how that was true for me and how my relationships in school were the things, the things I remember. I don't remember lessons or lectures. I remember discussing after the lecture with my friends after walking out of the class. So yeah, I think, I think it just clarifies what that kind of space to be nav navigated is. Chase, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to echo Alex here. The thing, like looking at my notes, that jumped out at me as the my biggest takeaway is essentially like what are those I guess you call them value propositions like what are those things that you're delivering that you don't get in a typical like you know in in my day off I'm going to go take a Coursera course and yeah uh, 
I'll just say I'll, I'm going to echo what Alex said. I think that's the that's my takeaway. Wonderful. Um, so I, I mean, I was really intrigued by by your story. I thought you're a very honest, kind of straightforward person, and uh, you know, I, I liked several of the things that you talked about. You know, the 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 conflict between trying to do good for the society and then trying to kind of shore up yourself, make sure that you're applying the same kind of self-care, um, the conflict between reason and emotion. These are the kind of themes that we talk about all the time, you know, from, from various angles. Uh, so it's a very rich, and I think it's a great, you know, education is a, is a very deep subject and um, it has been, um, I mean, the solutions that are there for, right, for education right now are just pretiful. Uh, given of given what the resources are and given what the technology is, whatever the solutions are, like universities, I mean, they're, they're just terrible. actually just as an aside, uh, Chase and I met because we were we were debate debate partners arguing against the motion that university education is not worth the price. So that's that's how we we met first time several years ago. So. Um, so thank you very much. So Ray, what are your takeaways? What are my takeaways? Um, well, I think this is the first time I, this is the first time I, I sort of opened up this much, I think on anything publicly uh, on the record here. And, and that to me is a takeaway because that's pushing some boundaries that I, that I felt a little comfortable kind of coming into this. Um, and that's been something that I've been trying to do and get more comfortable with over the past uh, couple of years. I think, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's focused on myself, but I, I think the, the, yeah, I just, I feel appreciative. You know, I, I thank you all for your attention. I thank you for, um, for your questions and for, uh, and for, for having me.